Dominic Raab. He taught us that some politicians will say whatever it takes to achieve their goals, and then when the reality doesn't match their promises, they'll simply change their narrative to suit it. Like in 2016, when he was telling people to vote for Brexit, he said, Do you accept that whatever our relationship is with the EU, if we leave the EU, that we can have no full access to the single market unless we agree to free movement of peoples. It depends what you mean by full access to the single market. I think we would not see any trade barriers go up because we're the fifth biggest economy in the world. And then when businesses started to suffer because of the chaos of Brexit, he blamed them instead. Well, I think it's probably rather easy at this moment in time for any businesses that isn't doing rather well to point to Brexit. It's rather easy for a business to blame Brexit and the politicians rather than to take responsibility for their own situation. And then when the Brexit deal that he negotiated started ruining British businesses, he denied it was anything to do with Brexit. The Scottish fishing industry in particular is drowning under red tape. Let me just read you two examples. Jamie McMillan of Loch Fine Langustines. We have no sales to the EU, our biggest market for live shellfish in the last two weeks. If we go another week without that, we are finished. And Donna Fordyce, who's chief executive of Seafood Scotland, says some businesses, which may have been run by families for generations, are now days away from collapse as a result of the agreement you have struck. Well, I, 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 I'm not convinced that that's a result of the agreement. And then when the damage of Brexit became too big for even him to deny, he said it wasn't a big deal. And there are lots of pieces of evidence now, again, hard evidence of actual companies moving hundreds of people out of the city and onto the continent of Europe. Given that the EU wants to take that business into its own territory, we don't have many levers to, as it were, use against them. The, the crucial question for the EU, it, it may be able to, if you like, nick a bit of business here or there. But he also taught us what it means when politicians lie, because it doesn't always mean that they're saying things that they know for a fact aren't true. It can mean that they're saying things that they have no reason to believe are true because they simply haven't bothered to check. Like, imagine telling people that Brexit wouldn't damage our trade with the EU at all, and then coming out with a line like this. And I hadn't quite understood the full extent of this, but if you look at the UK and you look at how we trade in goods, we're particularly reliant on the Dover-Calais crossing. And that's one of the reasons why, and there's been a lot of controversy about this, but one of the reasons why we've wanted to make sure that we have a specific and very proximate relationship with the EU to ensure frictionless trade at the border, particularly for just-in-time manufacturing goods, whether it's pharmaceutical goods or perishable goods like food. I don't think it's a question so much of the risk of major shortages, but I think, in, I th think probably the average consumer might not be aware of the full extent to which the choice of goods that we have in the stores are dependent on one or two very specific trade routes. And I hadn't quite understood the full extent of this, but if you look at the UK and you look at how we trade in goods, we're particularly reliant on the Dover-Calais crossing. Or imagine being two years into the negotiations of Brexit, a Brexit where you know the peace process in Northern Ireland has been a major issue, a Brexit which even Dominic Raab himself admitted later it is clearly uh, posing a threat uh, to the Good Friday Agreement. And then when you're asked whether you've read the Good Friday Agreement upon which peace in Northern Ireland is based, you say... Since you had such a critical role as, uh, role as the Brexit Secretary, I presume that in fact you had read the Belfast Agreement. Please don't line up behind the Immigration Minister and tell us that you haven't read the agreement? Um, I haven't sit down and started at the beginning and gone through it, yeah. but of course at various points in the negotiations, um, when issues have been raised, it has been an important opportunity to delve in to the different aspects so which, very carefully. So which aspects of the... So you haven't read the Belfast Agreement in its entirety? I haven't sat down and gone from... I've used it as a reference tool uh, and during the pandemic, he was the first Tory politician to really say with his whole chest, yes, it is one rule for us and another for the public. It's out there and people will be reasonably saying, you're not allowing me to gather with my friends and family at a wedding or a funeral, but look at what you guys well, are doing. In, in fairness, uh, there, have, there have always been different uh, principles for social entertainment or weddings than for government business. But to his credit, Dominic Raab has always been very upfront about who and what he is. My name is Dominic Raab. I'm the author of The Assault on Liberty, and I'm a Tory. I don't support the Human Rights Act, and I don't believe in economic 
and social rights. Called feminists obnoxious bigots, and when it came to people who use food banks... The typical user of food bank is not someone that's languishing in poverty, it's someone who has a cash flow problem episodically. Oh. No, it's true. Yeah. But... And his response to facing 24 allegations of bullying was to effectively threaten the whole country. May he never know rest or peace.